Welcome to the UAE Careers Community. This is our December information session, and we are really excited to welcome Roger McFarlane, who is the Technical Director of Culligan. Roger graduated as a chemical engineer from the University of Surrey in the UK in 1982. Soon after, he specialized in industrial water treatment and managed his first Legionnaire's disease outbreak in 1986. Since then, he's worked in a number of customer facing technical management roles for leading water treatment companies around the world. Roger has spent over 15 years in the Gulf and joined Culligan Middle East in 2011 as technical director based here in Dubai. He is responsible for their accredited water testing laboratories, water hygiene products and services, including chemical treatment programs, equipment, preparation of water safety plans, risk assessments and training programs. Culligan manages water across hundreds of industrial, commercial and residential sites here in the region. Welcome, Roger. Welcome to our UAE Careers community. Good morning. Pleased to be here. I feel like we've met before, Roger. Not too long just ago. Once or, just once or twice. <laughs> it's so great to have you here. And, and I know that um, we've, we've talked a lot about the topics we'll be discussing today. But in bringing careers practitioners together and meeting you, I am really excited more about what could come, the potential of bringing you onto this platform. The aim of the careers community here in the UAE is to raise the platform for careers education, is to really help students across the region begin to understand the realities of work and start connecting the dots between what they're learning at school and what they want to be doing when they do begin those aspiring careers. So in having you here as technical director, after having worked around the world and graduating with a chemical engineering program. Now, any careers practitioner will tell you when students walk through the office door, there's always a top three, being a doctor, being a lawyer, or being an engineer. Those tend to be those top three career choices. And I do want to talk a little more about your academic journey as a chemical engineer and how it changed. But before we do that, I thought that maybe you could introduce us all to Culligan, talk to us about some of the initiatives that you guys have been taking. And also, I'd like to celebrate the work that you've also done through the pandemic, a time when many engineers were made redundant through this global pandemic, but Culligan somehow found a way to find new initiatives that helped them, as Anu Jacob, one of your engineers told me, made them even busier through that pandemic. Yeah, okay, let's, uh, let's talk about Culligan generally. Culligan is water, it's all we do. Um, we are worldwide one of the leading water companies, uh, American company headquartered in Chicago, just outside Chicago. And an old company, um, an old name like Dairy Queen or Coca-Cola or something like this. Uh, Culligan was founded in 1936 by Emmett Culligan, um, a guy of Irish descent, who invented the water softener um, and then didn't have the money to build the business around or build a business around it. So he franchised it and uh, Culligan then became the oldest franchised company in the world and is still essentially a franchise business outside Europe and the Middle East and Africa. Um, hundreds and hundreds of dealerships across North America, uh, across the Pacific, um, and across into, um, it doesn't, it kind of peters out when it gets ac across as far as Europe. Um, Europe, the companies are owned by Culligan, and uh, Middle East and Africa, the companies are owned by Culligan, but we are auto company. We do nothing else. Um, I don't make furniture. Uh, I don't make ice cream. We are a, a, a water company. We are the only, in the Middle East, we are the only company who has uh, chemical manufacturing. We are the only business who has an accredited laboratory. We have two. We have a microbiology lab and a chemistry lab. The reason we do all of this is because we're a vertically integrated business here. We're so far away from the rest of the world that we want, you know, we want to be able to supply products and services locally. So 
until I joined the company, Culligan was buying chemicals from outside and importing them. That stopped the day that I joined um, until 2016, when we opened our uh, accredited labs, we were sending samples out uh, and paying good money to third party laboratories to analyze them. That all stopped. So now all, we're, all the work that we do, we do in-house. So many of our customers, hotels, hospitals, facilities management companies, want to deal with a one-stop shop. That's what we do. So we provide service, we provide equipment, we provide consumables, chemicals, lab services, you name it. So in the Middle East, we are quite a different business to what you would see from a franchise dealer in North America who are very focused on water softeners and bottled water and drinking water, recently drinking water solutions for households. In the Middle East, we are much more of a commercial and industrial business. So we have a projects equipment division um, who will uh, supply reverse osmosis plants, ultrafiltration systems, filtration plants for hotels, manufacturing plants, hospitals, dialysis units, um, capital projects, $100,000 and up. Those are the kind of systems that we do. And that was what Culligan in the Middle East was always known for. That was what we set up as. But at the other end of the scale, we have two water bottling plants one here in National Industries Park and one in El Coors. Um, we also have um, moved in the direction since Culligan globally has made some acquisitions, we're now moving much more towards bottle-free solutions, what we call our commercial drinking water division who uh, supply drinking water systems that work off of the mains. So they take mains water and filter it, remove bacteria, remove chlorine, chill it, sparkle it, heat it, and you can then get it. In fact, there's one you can just wave your hand over and, and you can get any of the waters that you require. Um, so that's now become quite a, a, a growing, uh, an important part of our business. We have a chemical engineering team um, who do pre-commissioned cleaning and flushing of chilled water networks, condensed water networks. A lot of people don't know that there is a chilled water network that runs... Um, underneath the tracks of the metro. So uh, the metro stations don't have their own cooling systems, they're district cooled. So we did all the pre-commissioned cleaning for that, Burj Khalifa, Burj Al Arab, all of the big airports, uh, shopping malls and so on and so forth. So big chemical engineering equipment, huge pumps, 250 kilowatt circulating pumps. And on the big systems, we'll have six or eight of those at a time. So big um, big chemical engineering um, projects. And then we have a specialist division in food service, um, coffee shops. It started with Starbucks. We were specified by Starbucks in America, started with Starbucks. And now we have literally thousands of food service outlets under service. Um, so we supply the equipment and then we service it to make sure that it's working. It's providing safe and good quality water for um, the consumers and there are many customers out there who are who would describe the water for a coffee shop or something like that is as mission critical if you're running even a kiosk um, uh, Starbucks the water is mission critical for them they don't work out of a, a five gallon bottle they actually have water um, on on tap so we will provide the service to keep that running 24 7 um, certainly uh, you know all the time that the the stores are open we've had situations um I'm, i'll just digress off because it's a it's a good story uh, we've had situations where restaurants have become big restaurants have been coming up for opening and the night before there's no water disaster they can't operate the shop they can't operate the place they can't make coffee they can't make drinks they can't cook food they can't wash the dishes, no water, because there's no water in the mall. So we have literally, from our other division, provided trucks full of bottled water and hand carried things up into up ladders into tanks up in the roof space. So um, dedicated service, high quality service, um, certainly the best 
uh, best in class service that you'll find because our customers expect nothing less. They can't operate their shops. They can't operate their, their cafes or restaurants without water. Um, that's, that's Culligan. You wanted me to talk a little bit about... Um, well, tell us, tell us let's, we got, let's celebrate the initiatives that Culligan... Ah, okay. Yes, yes. Right. Okay. Yes, I've gone out of my head. At the beginning of this year, when we were preparing for lockdown, um, we were writing processes and procedures that fell to me. Um, I do pretty much all of the technical writing for Culligan because um, it's just something I do and I've got plenty of experience doing it. My English is not bad and uh, my, my writing skills are okay. So I was writing all of those processes and procedures and policies because customers were asking them for us for it and we felt that it was the right thing to do to make sure that our staff understood what were, what was expected of them uh, what we were going to do for them um, and one of the things that we were tasked with was going and finding some sanitizer well myself and a couple of colleagues were going around supermarkets pharmacies nothing to be had absolutely nothing to be had and so we had at the time a um, a product that we were using for water treatment. We still sell it. It's a hypochlorous acid-based uh, biocide for drinking water. It's got all sorts of uh, drinking water approvals, and it's um, it was a very successful product. And I looked at it and said, well, what happens if we dilute this to make it a ready-to-use, bring down the concentration of it and make it into a ready-to-use product as a sanitizer, as an alternative to using alcohol? So I did. And we started handing it around the, 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 the staff in little spray bottles. Here's, here's one. I'm not going to flash the logos and whatever, but here's one that sits on my desk to this day. Um, zero alcohol. Um, and everyone liked it. Didn't find anyone who didn't like it. It doesn't have a smell apart from a little bit of like a, a mild swimming pool kind of chlorine -y smell. Uh, but it's got no perfume, no dye stuffs or anything like that. It's just pure sanitizer. People liked it. People who were getting some skin irritation with some of the alcohol sanitizers found that that all stopped. Um, some people who had a bit of dermatitis or some cuts or something like this, they all healed up and cleared up really quickly. The guy who sits in the office next to me, Marco, our sales director, came into my office one day and said, this is really good. Why don't we sell this? Why don't we put, on, put it on the market and, and, and start selling this? This was March, late, mid to late March. In order to put it on the market, in order to commercialize this, we had to do a few things. You have to get the product registered with um, Dubai municipality, you have to have lab testing done to prove that it is bactericidal, fungicidal, virucidal, that it does all of the things that you say that it's going to do. So we got all of that done, running around finding the laboratories and getting all of that done. And by the end of March, we had everything in place. We had all the certification that we wanted in place so that it could be used not just as a surface sanitizer, but it was actually registered for use as a hand sanitizer which was something quite special. Well, things got a little out of hand. Because it was registered as a hand sanitizer, that meant that it could be used in the sanitization tunnels that were installed in places like DP World, Emirates Global Aluminium, on all of their staff entry gates. Now, suddenly, we were not producing in little bottles like this. We were producing in one-ton bulk containers and we were producing 40 tons a day. And we were working 24 seven. Um, Anu, who you've spoken to, my production manager, was taking control of the day shift. She was working six days a week on days. I took over the night shift, so six nights a week on nights, and we basically rotated around so that the production supervisor covered the odd shifts that weren't being covered other ways. And literally, we, for, for, for the whole of um, April into May, we were just 24-7 producing as much as we possibly could. We really were, at times, 
we were on the edge of um, being able to keep up with the demand. Now, on the other side of the business, coffee shops were closed. There was a lockdown. Coffee shops, restaurants, all of those kind of places, hotels were closed. And as I said earlier on, our food service business relies on those customers. So that side of the business was very quiet. I mean, in, in some areas, it was completely dead. So to have a part of the business that was going crazy um, was really, it was, it was our salvation. There's no doubt about it. There, there, there's no doubt in anyone's mind that's working for Culligan that we would have had, we had to shed a few people, no doubt. Um, but we would have had to have shed a lot more people. We would have had problems maybe even to have closed down some divisions completely if we hadn't had uh, the sanitizer business uh, to keep us going. It's not just about the sales revenue. It's about the fact that we had people who were standing around twiddling their thumbs um, because their, their, their part of the business was either quiet or shut. They came and worked for us in chemical production. We went from uh, three production staff up to 12 per shift. And a lot of those people were coming from uh, service businesses. They were working as service technicians. We had guys who were document controllers, all sorts of people from various departments um, who were coming and working in chemical production. And so we then tasked some of the service supervisors um, with running production, we would put them on to, that we would train them how to um, produce and pack and do the basic quality control for uh, sanitizer so that they could carry on producing the product um, uh, during the, uh, the night shifts when I wasn't there. Um, but they would then run production and that only backed off crumbs that only really backed off sometime around about June, July. We backed down to a lower level and back down to our regular production sometime around about July, August time. So it was about keeping people employed. Uh, it was, and, I mean, we, there were some people who were a bit reluctant, people who said, oh, I don't know, chemical production, that sounds a little bit beneath me. Well, it's okay. If you want to go on to unpaid leave, that's up to you. But if you, carry, if you come and work in production, you'll get paid. They all came to production. Nobody took unpaid leave. Everyone came to production. One fellow who was uh, delivering for us, he was delivering salt to the various food service outlets. Suddenly his customer said, we don't need you to do that anymore. We'll do those deliveries. Uh, so he found himself out of a job. He now works in chemical production permanently. So. It's been a time of transition and change for us. Um, lots of things have changed. Um, the fundamentals of the business are we are still a water treatment company. We, are still, we still do fundamentally what we've always done. Um, but the focus has, been, uh, focus has been different. Management style has been different. Much, much more focus on um, teleconference meetings, even though we're all still in the office, we all sit at our desks and sit and look at our computers because there are other people in the organization in other parts of the Middle East who are at their desk. So we just do the same. There are four offices here and um, we all, you know, all of the directors of the company basically sit at, at their offices. We have a daily meeting. Yeah, we used to be literally every day, but now it's, it's just three days a week. Um, and we all sit at our desks. We don't sit in each other's offices because if we want to bring something up on the screen. We want to, uh, we want to talk about uh, some photographs that we've taken of a particular job. We can just bring it up on the screen and we don't have to sit with masks on and so on. We can just sit in our offices with the door closed and uh, be in our little safe bubble. How long that's going to last for? I think it, it, it could become a permanent feature. I think we may reduce the frequency of some of the meetings, but I think I think the idea of teleconference is going to it's, it's going to be permanent. Wow! Thank you, Roger. I know that with careers practitioners on the call and people in industry uh, wanting to listen in to gain some tips as well, I know that there's a, almost the top three focus for today is how do we prepare the youth for careers 
in organizations such as Culligan. How do fresh graduates hone in on experiences, especially in this part of the world where it's really, really hard to be gaining experiences? And as the technical director and someone who has gone through a chemical engineering academic pathway, what do you see that young engineers are not aware of and need to be more aware of if they want to go into the world with a degree in either chemical engineering or mechanical engineering or any other thread of engineering? I know it's a three large questions, but let's start with the first one. How do we prepare the youth as careers practitioners and recruitment officers um, in either secondary education, university, or, or beyond? How do we prepare them for careers at an organization such as Culligan? Okay, there are a few things around that. Try and take uh, opportunities and generate opportunities. It's the career practitioners, I would say, that I've interfaced with in the past who've been organizing things like internships. Um, I've run internships the whole time I've been in the UAE. Um, and many of the, I haven't done, I haven't worked with hundreds of interns, but the vast majority of the interns that I've worked with went on to work for the companies that they interned with. Um, there's a couple, of, I've got a couple of instances um, where um, I took on an intern um, who was from American University. Um, she was doing her second degree. First degree was in performing dance, very stylized performance. She was from Bangladesh. Her family were originally from Bangladesh, although she was born in uh, the UAE. Um, but a very stylized, very highly costumed uh, form of uh, performing dance. That was her first degree. And her second degree was as a chemical engineer. This maybe gives you some kind of a feel of how bright she was. So she came along um, as an intern, and as an intern, she was a little bit special. You, as the person running an internship, you quickly pick up on someone who is a bit special, a little different. And what do I mean by different? I would give her some work, which would typically take four days, four hours, and she would turn it around in four hours or four minutes. Um, very sharp very motivated, very switched on, only ever had to tell her something once. These are not engineering skills. These are skills which are valued by employers, irrespective of what your you know, core academic subject is. She is now working as uh, an assistant uh, manager um, for a major water treatment company here in, uh, here in Dubai. Um, another fellow who worked for me uh, went to, from being a, uh, an intern to being a service engineer, went from being a service engineer to being a sales engineer. I got him an interview with Nalco, one of the big um, global water treatment companies. He's gone on from there to being a technical uh, manager with um, BASF, and now he's moved on to, to do something else. It all starts with that opportunity and being able to demonstrate your ability to work, your ability to uh, respond to instructions, ability to grasp information. Um, and it's not just about you learning. It's about you being able to demonstrate your skills because if you're working, if you're doing an internship, you're working for a potential employer. And in many cases, I've taken those interns and turned them into full-time employees. Um, why not? Why not? The other thing I would say is that traditionally companies in the Gulf have employed expats. They've employed people from all over the world, maybe, maybe from South Asia, maybe from Philippines, but they've employed uh, people who have had their um, uh, qualifications and they've done their work experience outside the country. And they come in, they're like a fish out of water. They've got to get themselves a driving license. They've got to find their way around. They've got to learn about the country and the way things are done, the way that business is done, the way that everything is done. 
my experience with employing fresh graduates here is that they're completely different. They may be a little more naive in terms of their career experience because they haven't worked. They're fresh graduates. They've come straight out of school or university. But the difference is they have a whole bunch of skills that expats simply don't have. They have a driving license, typically. They may have their own car already, typically. They know their way around. Uh, they speak English. They can read and or write Arabic which someone who's coming from the Philippines absolutely won't have. I'm not picking on the Philippines, but someone who's coming from outside the country won't come with that kind of education. So I have the, the, the downside, the only downside of employing fresh graduates from here is um, they want to be the managing director of the company within two years. So it's about moderating that just getting people to understand that that first two years is going to be an apprenticeship. It's going to be quite tough. Quite likely you're going to be um, given a set of car keys and a test kit and told to go and do some service work somewhere. You've got to start at the bottom. Even though you've got a degree, you've got to start and you've got to learn. Consider it to be an apprenticeship. And, and I think that's if we can, if we can prepare our youth for that and we can open opportunities to get them into internships such as the kind of thing that that, that i've been doing and still do by the way um, um we're probably going to be ready to to take on some interns in 2021 obviously with covid this year it's been a bit tricky but i'm hoping that we're going to get back to a uh, situation normal and that the departments that i am responsible for so that's two laboratories and chemical production will be happy to, uh, to take on uh, some interns and ideally for not just a week or two. I would say uh, uh, an internship doesn't really start to get valuable until it's kind of six weeks and up, typically for the whole summer vacation or if someone could present me with a sandwich student where I'm going to get them for a year, perfect. Thank you. I know in, in our last conversation when you talked about Culligan's workforce, you described it as a young workforce with um, employees mostly in their younger, uh, early 30s or in their 30s with, you know, you described number one, uh, who the number one employee joined in 1993 and number two and number three have retired. What is, what does that mean for a workforce being younger and for people who are older who might have been made redundant through the pandemic? Because I think in, in understanding and helping the youth understand the longevity of a career, we have to be able to understand how the older generation and the younger generation can really work together. So what I'm trying to ask is, how does Culligan, having a young workforce, encourage older people to participate and apply, or do they? Um, they do. Um, our older generation people are revered. Um, our, I mean, goodness, I've only been working for Culligan 10 years. Um, our engineering technical director is in his 45th year with Culligan. Uh, he started working with Culligan in Italy as a service technician, then went into commissioning, then he was export sales manager, then he moved from Italy out to Qatar, became country manager for us for a few years there, and he's now engineering director here. He will retire from here. I think he's retiring at the end of this year. Um, and that's all to do with his pension back in Italy. He has to retire now, otherwise he loses something or another. But as far as Culligan is concerned, if he wanted to carry on working, he could carry on working. Now, what does that mean? Having that depth of experience, that breadth of experience and that depth of experience is that we've got young engineers who want to learn. And I, we, talked, we touched on this, and I think it's a really important thing, talking about fresh graduates and about people picking up on the experience of others. It comes from within. I can't force people to learn. I run training courses here, but I can't force people to learn unless I make the passing of the exam at the end of the course conditional on them keeping their job. That normally livens things up a little bit. 
Um, but it's the difference between people who see it as a job, something that earns some money that they can send home to their families and that they can feed and clothe their families here, or something that they see as a profession. And the difference is what I see when they come into my office and they sit down in front of my desk with a project, with something that they're working on that they need to find out about. At one end, I'll get an email with an attachment or two, please advise. That's it. That's the person for whom this is a job. They do not see themselves as a profession. They've got to get this project over a particular hurdle in order to move it forward and then they can, they can get it signed off. And then I have the people who come in and sit down in front of my desk with their mask on, with all of their papers, and we go through it together. Why? What's the difference? Because these guys want to learn. They want to, it's the difference between answering the question to move the project forward teaching people to fish or fishing for them. I try and avoid fishing for people if I can, but it's so much easier if they want to hold the fishing rod. If they grab the fishing rod out of my hand and say, right, you stand next to me and show me how this is done. Those are the guys who will become the professional engineers of the future because they are the ones who are wanting to learn and pick up the skills beyond their basic degree uh, for themselves. I know another topic that is really prominent in any career practitioner's office, whether it be at a university level or in secondary education, is around the power of a degree. Now, in our last conversation with parents at desk, we were talking about the ranking and privilege of, of a chemical engineering degree and, and what it was like in the past and, and how it still holds its rank. You mentioned to us about the training and the level of, of training that a chemical engineer goes through and, and becoming a professional. What can you advise a career practitioner who has a student in front of them that might be kind of swayed down the engineering path because parents are not really giving them much of a choice? How do you you know, what tips can you offer a practitioner to really enlighten them with the awarenesses that young people need to understand because of the commitment required for that training, not just getting the degree, but the training after the degree to be a qualified chemical engineer? There is no doubt that there are some tough subjects that you have to go through, whichever engineering subject you want to talk about. Um, chemical engineering is, is, is no different. What I would say is that uh, a chemical engineering degree is a much broader degree. Um, when I was at university, we used to have a half day session with our professor once a week where he would teach us about business. He would read the financial, he would buy a bunch of copies of the Financial Times and uh, hand them out to us all and, and we would read the Financial Times together. Um, we would understand about the share indices, we would understand about um, profit and loss accounts, how to do what a balance sheet looked like. Um, we also received uh, training, it was in our first and second year, um, management accounting, which was actually taught by the hotel and catering department. I've used that so many times since then because our professor was absolutely adamant that the chemical engineers were the plant managers of the future. We were not just the drones who were going to be uh, doing engineering drawings or doing some calculations or doing a pipe diagram or something like that. We were the ones, because of the breadth of our experience, who were going to rise to the top. My mentor, my dad's friend, uh, who, who advised me to move from agricultural engineering to chemical engineering, said so because of his own experience at Foster Wheeler, that the senior guys at Foster Wheeler, the guys who would rise up through the ranks and take the management posts, rather than just the senior engineering posts, were the chemical engineers. They were the guys with the breadth of experience to be able, or breadth of qualification, um, to be able to handle that kind of thing. Um, I would certainly say that that's the case 
here. I mean, out of four directs, five directors of the company, four of them are chemical engineers. I mean, we are a water treatment company, of course. So it kind of goes without saying that they, you know, but, but we are the ones who are managing the business. We're not the engineers. We're not the senior engineers. We're not the project managers. We're the, we're the, 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 the leaders of the business. And we've come up through the kind of chemical engineering route. But what I would say is, if you are a, a, a careers practitioner and you have a young person sitting in front of you who's kind of being shoved into, uh, to, to, to you, encouraged is the word I would perhaps use, by their parents uh, to become an engineer, ask them to really think about it. Because being an engineer, if you don't believe it, is like being a priest and not believing it. You really have to want to be an engineering professional. You have to understand what that means. Just coming out, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of, um, a lot of theory, a lot of exams, a lot of stuff that has to be done and you have to be dedicated to it whilst you're uh, even still at school and at college and at university. That's without the amount of time that you're going to spend doing some kind of apprenticeship when you leave when you start work as an engineer there's a lot of dedication that's going to have to go into that and you've got to be pretty sure that that's something that you want to be doing for the rest of your life as a professional and consider yourself to be a professional before you dive into it it's that's the time where you know you maybe think to yourself yeah but i'm good at maths well be an accountant I don't want to demean an accountancy, you know, accounting degree or a finance degree, but in any way. But being an engineer is very different. You've got to be able to build something that's going to work. You've got to you've got to be able to create things that are going to be safe. You know, it's a, it's a the, the the requirement is much higher in terms of the expectations as a as a, as a professional. Um, so I would say quiz them ask them is it something that they really want to do or is it something and and do they understand what the opportunities are and the amount of work that it's going to take the amount of effort that it's going to take in order to get there and the kind of things that they're going to have to learn in order to get there now my own personal experience and i've said this to you before maria i i studied reaction in my final year i studied reaction kinetics and chemical thermodynamics never used them since but I had to learn them enough to be able to get through the exam and they were really tough subjects you know partial differential equations and things like this which fried my brain you know if you're not willing to to, to devote yourself to doing that with the potential rewards that come further down the line choose a different degree go and do something else may I'm not saying you shouldn't do a vocational degree but maybe not a uh, not an engineering degree. Talk to us a little bit about the CSR program at Culligan and and how young people should take advantage of community service in if they are considering joining an organisation such as Culligan. Um, we've done uh, so. CSR is is not a formal program for us. But we do have um, we do have work with, uh, as I mentioned before, we do have uh, internships. Um, I've had an intern who's been working uh, working here for crumbs. She worked here for about three years. I say worked. She did a formal internship. She was introduced by her father, who con literally out of the blue. It wasn't done um, because of her school or anything. She was at the uh, the English school in Sharjah at the time coming up to doing her A-levels and uh, he approached us and said you know my daughter is a, a, is looking to be a chemist can you know can you give her a, a, an in, a short internship so she can see whether it's something that she wants to do so um, bearing in mind they were coming over from Sharjah and we we're at the south end of Dubai her father was incredibly devoted he drove her here every day for six weeks and um, as a result of that it confirmed in her mind that she wanted to be a chemist we hadn't managed to put her off um, she's now uh, studying chemistry at Loughborough in the UK 
Uh, bearing in mind that she was uh, of Indian origin, um, she'd been born here in the UAE, but uh, she holds an Indian passport because her parents were both uh, Indian nationals. Um, her father um, um, and relatives literally threw everything they had at getting the funding together for her to go to university at Loughborough in the UK to study chemistry. She's in her final year. She's worked for Johnson Mathey, uh, also in the UK. Um, and all of that started with a six-week short internship. The following year, she'd started her degree the following year, she came to me directly. She, she uh, called me and said, I'd like to do some work as a lab technician. I don't want an internship. I don't want any certificates at the end of this. I'd like to do some work as a lab technician. Can you chain me to a bench in the lab somewhere? And uh, I just want to find out what industrial lab work looks like. Okay, welcome. Thankfully, we had an opportunity. We'd lost uh, uh, an analyst and it was taking some time to replace them. So the timing was perfect. Once again, we didn't manage to put her off. Um, she, uh, uh, she, she still stuck to her guns. Um, I was in touch with her. Sadly, both of her parents died. Um, so she's very much on her own now. She has relatives who she um, uh, here in, in Sharjah who, who, who look after her, but she's not planning on coming back to the UAE. She's planning on staying in, in the UK. No, although she's going to come out with, she's uh, targeted with a first class uh, degree. She's not got any plans to do any postgraduate stuff at this stage. She wants to go straight into work. Um, she's asked me for a reference based on the internships that she's done and the work that she's done for us. Um, so we're always open to stuff like that. Uh, Anu is incredibly good. And uh, Dr. Priya, who is our technical manager in the chemistry lab, um, and Joby, who runs our uh, microbiology lab, are all incredibly good at um, running internships, actually managing internships on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we take them quite seriously. We expect uh, all of the interns to do some project work. They, we expect all of them to give a presentation at the end of our, uh, their internship to find a, 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 on a topic of my choosing. I give them a, a topic at the beginning of their internship and we expect them to give a brief uh, presentation at the end of it. We issue them with a, a formal certificate. Um, that's about as, I think that's about as good as it gets. We certainly don't have any interns doing photocopying, doing data entry, making coffee, nothing like that. They are very much formal internships and, and we're quite proud of that. In thinking about the conversations that you may have had with, say, this young student who then went off to the UK to study, I'm sure that you, you're aware of, of the concerns of employment for the future, but in looking at you know, the initiatives that you have at Culligan, with the different types of projects you're working on from bottle free solutions to capital projects to the specialist division you have and then even looking at the sanitation projects that you're working on how do you or how do you or sorry let me rephrase that what would you say to a young candidate a young uh, student either leaving secondary education or fresh graduate about globalization and, and the work outside of the region now i know that in our last conversation you talked about culligan middle east being owned by culligan north america and you talked to us about the differences in uh, the north americans having their own independently owned um, enterprises but when you look at having people working here in the region and they may have to move or they may want to move either for promotion or by force, what kind of tips can you give the youth about globalization in organizations such as Culligan? There are some great opportunities. Um, a few of the guys that have worked for me over the years, over the last 10 years, have um, moved overseas. Um, Canada is a very popular destination. Uh, plenty of work there, plenty of opportunities there. The experience that they gain here is very valuable in terms of um, 
the breadth of experience that you get, the depth of the technical knowledge that you have to have in order to work in this uh, in this market is seen as being quite valuable. They've all gone and found jobs in in uh, what you would expect to be uh, tough and competitive um, jobs markets. Um, but uh, I'm in touch with all of them. Um, some via LinkedIn, some via LinkedIn and Facebook, because um, people that work for me are not just employees. They, you know, they become friends over time and, you know, it's good to stay in touch with people and find out what they're doing. And they want to stay in touch with me because they want to find out what I'm doing. But it's great to see them moving on. Um, so, um, and it, this doesn't just apply to engineering. This applies, I mean, I've got guys who have worked for us um, in finance, who've gone off to America, taken their families with them. Um, different nationalities, but predominantly Indian nationals, some Pakistani nationals, um, who've taken their um, skills and gone and got green cards uh, and got jobs in America. So it is possible to do. And this jobs market is certainly a place where you can get the experience and the job skills and the training and the knowledge to uh, to, to go and do that thank you and I could I could talk to you forever I, the conversations that we always have are, are very rich with information and tips but I'm going to open it up to a Q&A from our parts and from our audience members I can't see anything in the chat right now but as we're waiting for them I know I've asked you a lot uh, over the last two hours almost. What am I not asking you that you think, you know, practitioners should be aware of? Um, I would ask people to look at their CVs, ask students to look at their CVs. What does it say? Does it say, I've studied this, I've studied that, I've got this qualification, I've got this prize, I've done so-and-so at school, at university? That will not elevate a student above their peers. If I'm reading a CV, I want to find out more about the person. I want to find out that they have interests outside school or university. I want to find out that they've done maybe some volunteer work. I want to find out maybe that they've done an internship and I want to see some detail about that. I want maybe to find out that they've done some part-time work. Maybe they've got uh, a job doing some marketing or they've got a job uh, working at concerts or something like this. Anything, selling mobile phones, anything something that's outside their academic um, experience and qualifications, if you like, to show the depth and breadth of the, of the, of the individual. Now, I know for, for some people, that's a real challenge because nowadays, much more so than ever before, people are focused on these. Mm -hmm. They're focused on their phones. They're focused on um, their TV, they're focused on their PlayStation, they're focused on stuff that is just revolving around them. I don't care about that as far as an, if I'm an employer. I want to see more breadth, more depth, and certainly stuff that's outside what they... They, they could be an A-star student, but for me, I'm afraid that's not good enough. I want to see something a bit more. I can't agree with you more, Roger. That's something... I know that I'm always uh, talking to students about, I know the careers practitioners uh, who join me at the UAE careers community. It's always a conversation that we come back to is how do we help the youth understand there's more than what happens in the classroom uh, when they're thinking about future careers. I can't see any questions coming through the chat box. So I think. Well, that can I, can I just follow on from what we were just saying? Cause there's something else I want to add. Please, yes. We've talked about internships. But understand that as someone who offers internships, I could be offered half a dozen potential interns. How do I choose from one intern to another? What am I going to be looking for? Am I, uh, so looking at as, as, as an employer, potential employer of one of those interns, because interns are potentially a source of permanent employees. So 
I'm not just looking at someone, is this going to be an interesting intern? Is this going to be a bright young spark who's, who's, who's going to be an interesting person to have around the place for a few weeks? I'm looking for something beyond that. I'm looking at potentially them as a permanent employee further down the line. And that all fins, that all kind of harks back to what I was just saying about you're actually looking for the same kind of things as you would for a, a permanent employee. That's really, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, it raises the careers practitioner and it makes career practitioners also begin to see that the work they're doing with students is not just about getting them to university, but it's about giving them, uh, it's almost like a recruitment service within an, or in, within an, an institution. So thank you for, for bringing that and, and making us realize that an internship is not just an experience, it's actually an opportunity for students to gain future employment and they're going to be assessed almost on the same grounds as a, a potential employee in getting that internship. I can see Karishni sending out a question. In the student CV, would you rather see multiple things that he or she has done or excelling in one field? What would you advise? I'd be happy with either. Let's imagine that I get a CV for someone who is a, um, an athlete and they are, uh, they are a star athlete whatever type of athletics it is, maybe cycling, running, whatever it is, that's their focus, that's their specialization. If you look at someone like that, they don't really have a lot of time for anything else. So the fact that they are gold medal winners and so on and so forth in their, in their chosen sport, that would be great as far as I'm concerned. But similarly on the other side, if I were to see um, someone who has a wide range of different things on, to, on their CV. They're a member of various clubs. They've done some part-time work. Maybe they've done some internships. Stack all of that little lot up and, and, and it would be hard to choose between the two. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. What the, what, the, what, what the one thing does is it shows their ability to focus. It shows their ability to... Um, to block out other things and do something. So you're go maybe going to get a different type of in, uh, individual and it will very much depend on the kind of opportunity that you were going to be putting them into. Exactly, would you say that it's important to be tweaking the CV based on the, the job description or, you know, I think a lot of young people and, and even people of, of different age groups, when they're looking for work, they seem to think there's like a one size fits all. And I know I hear this a lot. They go to recruitment agents and try to get their CVs drafted for them. Do you think that they should have a one size fits all or should they really look at the specifics of what they're applying for and tweaking that CV? If it really matters, if it really matters, they should be tweaking the CV. They should be putting in at least a covering letter or a covering email that shows that they've done some research and that they understand uh, the, 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 the role that they're uh, looking for. Um, I would also say you can't tweak a CV to the extent that you can create activities and you can create interests and you can create part-time jobs. You've got to have done them. And I think if that encourages students to get out there and go and do something else, I think that's got to be a good thing. Because the moment someone's sitting in front of me, I'm going to be asking questions about what's on the CV. If they don't have the depth of the knowledge, th they'll be embarrassed immediately. Exactly. Thank you, Roger. We're going to bring it to an end. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. We met with Roger McFarlane, who is the technical director at Culligan. We talked about all things preparing the youth for future careers. And Roger gave us lots of insights that we're definitely gonna be taking away back to our educational institutions or back to our students and helping them prepare for future careers. Thank you everybody for joining. We'll see you all in the new year when we bring the team from IC3 talking to us about all things career practitioners. Thank you, Roger. We'll see you again. Thank you, bye-bye.